financial crises happen all the time. Big crashes aren't uncharted territory. But where were you when the biggest financial crisis of our time actually happened? Where were you when the music stopped? I know that I was actually sitting in my office in Canary Wharf, London, looking out across where the tube station is and seeing people walk out of Lehman with cardboard boxes full of their personal effects, their photos, their staplers, everything else from their desks. Why was I sitting there? A couple of months earlier, I had been to New York for lunch, and I'd met a guy called Tony Alvarez of the big restructuring firm Alvarez and Marsal. And over lunch, he said to me, Anne, the banking industry's in really bad shape. There's gonna be a major bank failure. And we are looking for people who know how to operate banks to join our firm to be able to act when it happens. So I joined the firm to be head of the financial practice across Europe. And on the 15th of September 2008, I found myself looking across the street at Lehman, only to discover that it was going to be my home for the next three years. So what do you think about when you hear the term Lehman Brothers? Were they the bad guy, or were they just the fall guy? Uh, films have been made about this, books have been written. But the truth is, it all began when people started giving loans to people who couldn't afford to buy houses. This was called subprime debt. And these loans soon became completely worthless assets. In the meantime, the investment banks packaged up these assets into special purpose vehicles called very cool names like Excalibur. And they sold them to other wholesale buyers as if they were really good debt. Now, maybe you're wondering about names like Excalibur. As you know, I'm sure this was the magical sword that gave King Arthur his God-given right to the kingdom. Now, anyone who thinks they've got a God-given right to anything is probably in trouble. And maybe the people in Lehman thought that Excalibur could actually conjure good debt from bad. But what were the people in Lehman really like? Well, I actually met quite a few people from Lehman, and I've got to say they were far from lemmings. But it was lemming-like behavior that caused the crisis, that common behavior across the whole industry. And Lehman carried the can for that. So let's start looking at those individuals that actually went over the cliff. Lehman had a really strong leader one who'd been really resilient for a number of years, 30 years in the firm, Dick Fold, the chairman and CEO, had lived through the first prime debt crisis, and he was actually voted the top CEO in the private sector two years before the crisis. He was far from a lemming. What he was, was actually the gorilla of Wall Street. That's how he was known. He was tough. He was a survivor. And he, he actually never groomed anyone to take over from him. He survived many number twos. 
I suppose in today's world, we would probably describe him as a celebrity CEO. It's the type of leader that actually makes boards feel pretty uncomfortable today. Boards are actually looking for CEOs who have a very balanced senior team who they listen to. Fold clearly believed, and you can see this from the eyes, that he would do a deal right until the end. But his grand plans of creating a good bank and a bad bank actually came to naught. Because, quite honestly, while the Fed were rescuing other banks like Bear Stearns, they didn't lend that hand to Lehman. And it's interesting, really, because he was quite a visionary guy. His solution to the problem of a good bank and a bad bank was what was adopted by everyone across the industry to actually manage through the crises. So why did the government let Lehman go? Well, no one knows the answer to that question. But Brian Marsal, who actually led the whole of Lehman Holdings around the world during Chapter 11, was asked that question, and he said, you'll have to ask the Fed that. But what I think it indicated was to the financial community, hey, there's no free ride. And also, the Treasury was signaling a need for fear to moderate greed. So what happened next? When Lehman went down, it was a complete feeding frenzy. The best assets are always the easiest to sell. And these assets were sold really quickly. Barclays stepped in and they bought the American part of Lehman for a song. Nomura stepped up, they bought big parts of Asia Pacific and also Europe here. And as the person who managed the sale of many Lehman assets across Europe, I can tell you there was a constant stream of lawyers, PE firms, um, people who bought investments at their lowest, so-called bottom feeders, actually turning up at the door, trying to make the most out of the Lehman situation. Then you've got to add to that the fact that investment banks are really complex. The part of Lehman that I was managing had over 3,000 legal entities. And we actually had some assets that would probably surprise you. I mean, sure, you know, we had things like um, financial institutions in Germany, France, and Russia. We had data centers in Sweden. We actually owned gas plants in Turkey. And we had a few commodities here and there, such as yellow cake uranium in the ground in France and Canada. Try selling that to a legitimate buyer in a hurry. And of course, we had the six trillion face value swap book. And the challenge really was, when Lehman went down, the bankruptcy laws, as they are today, are a complete patchwork quilt across the world. And so parts of the bank were falling under nationalistic regimes, which could never optimize the whole return. And it became very clear that letting Lehman go actually caused a massive destruction in value. For the swaps book alone, it was estimated between about 50 and $75 billion. And what happened to the people? There were about 25,000 people in Lehman when it went down. And most went on to actually go back in and create careers in financial services. Some of them stayed on to create that good bank and actually sell assets of Lehman. Some of them, however, left banking altogether, said this is not the life for me. Uh, one woman here in London actually opened an Italian food company. Another guy uh, opened an online pet service. So there were entrepreneurial people who survived, who were resilient, and who recreated their lives. But, but what about the aftermath of Lehman? The financial collapse 
caused such public outcry that the regulators stepped in really strongly. And there was a tsunami of regulation, whether it was Dodd-Frank, VOCA, EMEA, MIFID, and a whole new set of regulators were born. And actually, it continues in industries today. Um, you know, the data sharing that's going on across industries will be curtailed by the privacy regulators. The gig economy is going to be hit by employee protections. So it's not just the financial services industry that are hit this way. But doesn't it sometimes feel that regulation is a bit like when you're going through an airport and being scanned? I know when I show up at Heathrow, which I do every week, and find out that the plastic bag that I put my liquids in is the wrong plastic bag, <laughs> and then I need to take them all out and put them into somebody else's plastic bag, to, you know, I'm feeling, do I feel any safer about this? Of course not, because it's not the bag that's the problem. And the thing is, that even today, there are so many regulators that people are spending time just packaging and repackaging the same risk. And it's not making us any safer. Now, that's not to say that we don't need regulation. We need really good regulation, and we need to co-create it with business. But I know from experience that you can't really make regulation on the fly either. When you're in the middle of a crisis, you have a need for speed. When I was managing Lehman across Europe, I'd lost my regulatory umbrella at, at the beginning. So I crossed the street to talk to the FSA and said, how can I unwind this swap book? I don't have a regulatory umbrella. And they said, you're right. That's a big problem. I think we'll really help you and we'll try and rush this one through. And I said, fantastic. How long is it going to take? And they said, well, if we're really fast, it'll be about six months. <laughs> this is at a time when every minute and every hour, things are unwinding and massive value destructions occurring. So a different solution had to be sought that day. So what's happened since then? Well, the whole industry's transformed. Of the five big Wall Street banks, one died, that's Lehman, two were absorbed into other banks, and two survived. And the market bounced back. It bounced back within six years. Given the size of the crisis, that was fairly fast. What hasn't bounced back yet is trust in financial institutions. But hopefully, that will come. Because there's always going to be a new villain in town. And right now, the digital and the social media players are having their own poignant fall from grace. So what about the question at the beginning about, will we face another crisis? You heard in margin call all of the crises that we've been through in the last few years. And so I would say that the answer to this is undoubtedly yes. But probably the next crisis won't be caused in the same way as the last one. Maybe it'll be a big cyber crime of attack, which will cause a drop in confidence. Maybe it'll be caused by political turmoil or a huge insurance default because of climate change. But the other thing that could happen is, when it does happen, it could escalate really quickly, because now we've got algorithmic trading, and the computers are trading at a much faster rate than humans ever could. And we're going to need every analytical tool. We're going to need artificial intelligence. And we're going to need all the help we can get to bounce back from the next crisis. 
And some of that regulation is going to help us in the future. The fact that the regulators have made the banking system more transparent, the fact that they're actually routing transactions through clearing houses now that have all sorts of mechanisms to protect against risk, such as margin calls. Of course, I'm going to say that because I'm the chairman of Ice Clear Europe, one of the biggest clearing houses in the world, dealing with 60 billion a day. But other things could actually be the cause of the financial crisis. Yes, actually, clearing houses are systemic um, risk infrastructures. And actually, if you look at the governments and the regulators forcing the banks to take less risk, they're probably less able to absorb the future shocks that could occur in the next crisis. And even today, in the US, regulations are rolling back and some of those rollbacks could well be setting the seed for the next crisis. But history shows that we're going to pull through. And if I think about crisis and what I've experienced in my career, I have quite a lot of knowledge about it. I joined Citibank in October 1987, three weeks before Black Monday. What timing. <laughs> I actually was in the foreign exchange business when Drexel Burnham Lambert collapsed. That, that was a big bank at the time. It only had a size of about 3 billion versus 650 billion for Lehman. I moved to ABN AMRO and became the CEO of the payments business, only to live through one of the biggest hostile takeovers in the world. Um, I ended up managing Lehman Brothers through the European part of the crisis. And after that, I went on to help the Irish banks restructure their property portfolios, and I was even preparing to be an expert witness in the Bernie Madoff case. What a career. <laughs> and all I can say about that career is that when the next crisis happens, what experience tells me is there will always be great leaders to pull us through. Because as Churchill said, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. Thank you.